Welcome to topic 11, in which we're going to think about the vibrations of polyatomic molecules. So if you have a molecule with several atoms, each of the n atoms in your system has, has three degrees of freedom, corresponding to motion in the x, y and z directions of space. So if a molecule has n atoms, overall the molecule is going to have 3n degrees of freedom. So we can represent it with this diagram here. So each atom has got three directions in which it can move. Three of these 3n degrees of freedom correspond to the translation of the whole molecule in the x, y and z directions. So therefore, these ones are not of interest for us for vibrations. Three more of these degrees of freedom describe rotation of the whole molecule about the x, y and z axes. So that gives a further three degrees of freedom that we're not interested in because they're not related to vibrations. And these are the three rotations we can do. This leaves us with 3n minus 6 degrees of freedom which correspond to vibrations. So these are these are motions in which bond lengths of the molecule change. Now, 3n minus 6 is the equation you need to use for a nonlinear molecule, but if the molecule happens to be linear, then only two of these degrees of freedom correspond to rotations, so therefore we, we have 3n minus 5 vibrational degrees of freedom. So when you're working out how many vibrations a molecule has, you need to first think about whether it's linear or not, and then make sure you use the appropriate equation, either 3n minus 6 or 3n minus 5. As with diatomics, only the vibrations which cause a change in dipole moment are infrared active. So you can have lots of vibrations, but if they don't change the dipole moment of the molecule, you won't see them in a vibration absorption spectrum. The same goes for Raman scattering. So if you have a vibration which causes a change in polarizability of the molecule, then they will be Raman active and you'll observe in observe them in a Raman rotation, sorry, a Raman vibration spectrum. Let's think of a simple simple molecule like water. So H2O, we've got three atoms, so and it's not linear, so therefore we have 3n minus 6 vibrations n is 3, so 3 times 3 is 9, minus 6 gives us 3. So we have three vibrations for this molecule. These vibrations are fairly complex motions of the atoms with respect to each other. They have different vibration wave numbers and they involve different motion of the atoms. If you think of the atoms being held together by three springs, this is what would actually um, come out of analysing the motion um, using mathematics. These three vibrations are known as the normal modes of the molecule. So a normal mode is defined as an independent synchronous motion of atoms or group of atoms that may be excited without exciting other modes. So it is actually possible just to excite one particular vibration of a water molecule if you shine light of exactly the right wavelength on it. Each of these independent normal modes can be approximated as a harmonic oscillator and then you have the normal harmonic selection rule delta V is equal to plus or minus one. Let's take CO2 for example. So it's a linear molecule so we have 3n minus 5 and this gives us four vibrational modes. So there are two stretches. There's a symmetric stretch and an asymmetric stretch. If we think about the, the symmetric stretch, as the CO bonds get longer, the dipole moment of the molecule doesn't change. So therefore this transition is infrared inactive. However, the polarizability of the molecule does change. So this is Raman active. So we'd observe the symmetric stretch in, in a Raman vibration spectrum, but we wouldn't observe it in a, in a vibration absorption spectrum. 
The asymmetric stretch, on the other hand, does lead to a change in dipole moment, so it's going to be infrared active, so we'd observe a peak in the vibration absorption spectrum, but it doesn't lead to a change in the polarizability of the molecule, so it's going to be Raman inactive. We've also got two um, degenerate bends of the molecule. Both of them will lead to a change in the dipole moment of the molecule, so it's going to be infrared active, so it would appear in the vibration absorption spectrum, but they're and they don't lead to a change in the polarizability of the molecule, so they're Raman inactive. So here we can see the complementarity between infrared and Raman um, vibration spectroscopy. In fact, there's a rule of mutual exclusion which you can use to work out whether um, a vibration is going to be infrared or Raman active. This bit states that if a molecule has a center of symmetry, this we can represent with the letter I, then Raman active vibrations are infrared inactive and vice versa. If there's no center of symmetry, then some, but not necessarily all, vibrations may be both Raman and infrared active. I'm sure you'll come back to this in the symmetry course later on. We won't worry too much about that for now. If you're interested and want to read more at this stage, then you can go and have a look in the, the book by Banwell for a more detailed in discussion of this rule of mutual exclusion. Okay, if we've got an even more complex molecule and we want to work out whether a given normal mode is infrared active, then we use symmetry considerations. This is going to be covered as part of the inorganic chemistry module, um, so again we're not going to, to worry about it here. To round off this topic, there's some homework, some pages to read, there's a worked example and some questions in House Crofton Constable for you to have a go at.